Hi everyone, this is Dan with 5 Lines to Know. Today we're going to be looking at the French Defense Advance Variation. The Advance Variation begins like this. We have E4, E6, D4, D5, and now E5. So here, the most popular reply for black is to attack the center straight away. Uh, this happens with c5. Now, white needs to defend this and play c3. And now, over the next few moves, you'll see black continue to attack the d4 square. So we have knight c6 and white defends with knight f3 and then we're going to look at the line with queen b6 here just piling on pressure onto the d4 square now here white typically will play a3 this is the main line of the advanced variation the reason to, that white plays a3 here is a preparation to play b4. Uh, white obviously can't play b4 right away uh, as black will just take on d4 and then uh, after c takes d4 the pawn will just be hanging on b4 so white needs to prepare b4 with a3. Now black has a couple of choices here uh, black can play c4, closing the position, or uh, black can play knight h6. Now, it might look tempting for white to take the knight on h6. However, this would be a bad idea, as uh, the black queen will take on b2. For example, if we have... Uh, Bishop takes h6, Stockfish now evaluates this at minus 1.5 after queen takes b2. And if white tries to save the rook uh, by playing knight bd2, the situation actually gets slightly worse for white after g takes h6. We have, we have an evaluation now of minus 1.8, uh, so black is almost winning here already straight out of the opening. The main reason for that is that black is going to pick up another pawn here. Uh, well, black is threatening to pick up the c3 pawn and if white tries to defend with rook c1, uh, black can play c takes d4, we have c, ta uh, c takes d4, and then knight takes d4, and the knight covers b5, and really white doesn't have any better op option here than to simply take the knight on d4. And white is simply two pawns down in this position. So instead of taking the knight on h6, uh, white continues with the plan... Uh, of playing b4 that was put in preparation by playing a3 on the previous move. Now black's best move is to take in the center so black takes on d4 we have c takes d4 and now knight f5 threatening to take on d4. So white has two main ways of defending this one is uh, bishop e3 and the other is bishop b2. We're going to look at both. Um, in the second line we're going to look at bishop b2 but first we're going to look at bishop e3. Now black's main idea here in the advanced variation is to really attack the white pawns on d4 and e5 because they form kind of the crux of white's position here. Uh, white is 
able to maintain an advantage in space as long as white has these pawns on d4 and e5. So typically black here will play f6 to attack the center. White now can't allow black to take on e5 as this as the pawn center would uh, crumble then, so white has to take on f6. And we have g takes f6. Now we typically have a developing move, bishop d3 here. Now black will create a backwards pawn on e3 by taking the bishop. Black will set to work right away, attacking this backwards pawn by playing bishop h6, a natural place for the bishop, and white will defend with queen e2 typically. And here black can simply castle. Uh, it may look as if the king is somewhat unsafe, uh, however, the situation is not too bad. Uh, white does not ha have the dark squared bishop anymore, while black still has the dark squared bishop, so that provides some extra protection to the king. Um, if white can make use of the open g file here, uh, then the situation could become dangerous for black, but at the moment, black's king is not in any immediate danger. So here now white will continue developing with knight c3. Uh, we're going to have bishop d7, and now white will castle. Now the main idea for black here is going to be to take control of the c-file and to pile pressure on the backwards pawn on e3. So black is going to start this plan by playing knight e7 with the idea of bringing the knight to f5 and uh, putting pressure on the pawn on e3. Black is also going to want to play rook c8 at some point. Um, for example, white could play king h1 here, bring the king to a safer square, uh, and now black could play rook a c8, attacking the knight, and uh, black might like to double rooks on the c file, and uh, perhaps try to chase the bishop away from d3 so that the knight can come to f5, while white will also... Uh, battle for the c-file, likely by playing rook a c1 here, and um, white will at some point uh, would like to play e4 when the time is right um, to, to undermine the black pawn center and possibly bring the knights into an attack on the black king. So this concludes our look at the first line in today's video. In our second line today, we're going to be looking at the main line again. So we're going to be continuing here as we did in the first line uh, with c3, knight c6, knight f3, queen b6, a3 once again, knight h6 again, b4, c takes, c takes, knight f5, and now instead of bishop e3, we're going to have bishop b2, which leads to quite a different game. So here, black's most popular reply is simply to develop the bishop to d7. And now white uh, will typically kick the black knight away from its rather strong position on f5 by playing g4. Black's most natural reply is to go back to e7 here. And now white needs to develop, so white is going to do that with knight c3. Now, black has a few options here, uh, but actually the option that scores the best uh, is to play knight g6. 
Uh, knight g6 is an interesting move. It uh, opens the diagonal up for the bishop again and controls an important square at f4. Now white's main move here is to play knight a4 attacking the queen and we have queen d8 here as the queen will have a much better future on the h4 to d8 diagonal than if it went back to c7 for example. And now typically white will try to attack here by playing h4. Now white is threatening to play h5, so black needs to play h5 themselves, themselves first. And uh, now white can either take or play g5. g5 is better as it really increases white's stranglehold on the space on the king side and makes it much more difficult for black to play f6 or other types of moves that would attack white's pawn center. Of course this comes at the expense of the white king's safety which is uh, which has been greatly reduced by the pawn pushes of h4 and g5. However, if white can maintain this sort of pincer of pawns on e5 and g5, controlling important dark squares on the 6th rank, uh, white shouldn't be in too much trouble here. Black will typically play b6 here to prevent the knight uh, coming to c5, and an interesting battle will ensue here where uh, Black will do everything possible to undermine the white pawn center and to uh, take control of the open C file and hopefully eventually mount an attack against the exposed white king, while white will try to translate the advantage in space into a material advantage. So this concludes the second line of today's video. So in the third line of today's video we're going to be looking at a different variation from the main line. Uh, we're going to be looking at what happens if instead of a3 white plays bishop e2 on move 6. So this is known as the Paulson attack and uh, here black will typically take in the center c takes d4 white takes and now once again we have knight h6 now here white has many options but actually the option that scores overwhelmingly the best for white is indeed to take the knight on h6 so that's the variation that we're going to be looking at this scores 63% wins for white and only 22% wins for black. So here we enter into this variation which is bad in the main line but which is much better for white here in the Paulson attack um, where black takes on b2 we have knight bd2 and now g takes h6. Now here white's best move is to castle simply to get the king to safety develop the rook into the game and now black has many options but perhaps the best option and the one that the engines suggest is to take the pawn on d4. It looks dangerous, but as we'll see, it is actually all right for black to take this pawn. Now here, black is two pawns up, but white has significant compensation for the two pawns. 
the Black King is in the center and won't be particularly safe if Black castles. Um, Black's bishop on f8 is also tied to the protection of the pawn on h6. Uh, black is underdeveloped compared to white. And in general, white just has much more space to maneuver, move around here compared to black. So here we'll typically have rook b1, and this uh, attacks the queen, and now obviously if the queen moves to anywhere else than c3, the knight on d4 will be hanging, so black typically will just take the bishop with check, queen takes, and then we have queen a3. Now white would like to get a knight to b5, where it can threaten a check on c7, uh, which would be quite dangerous if there was a rook on the c file. So uh, white will play knight d4, and black has to play a6 here to prevent the knight coming to b5. White will typically take advantage of the open c file here, although other options are of course possible, but uh, rook fc1 is a natural move, placing both the rooks on open files here. And now black will develop the bishop to d7. We're going to conclude looking at the line here, but uh, the points that I mentioned earlier are all still in effect. The black king is in the center, the bishop is tied down by the protection of the pawn on h6, and white has much more mo room to maneuver, the white rooks are on open files, so the two-pawn advantage that black has is definitely compensated by all of white's counterplay opportunities here, and this is why Stockfish evaluates this at 0.0, .0 a completely equal position. So typically here, white will try to invade the black queen side with the rooks. Uh, moves like rook c7, and inevitably rook takes b7 are likely coming. Black must survive this attack, um, but if black is able to weather the storm, uh, black will have excellent prospects in an endgame where uh, if black can maintain a material advantage. So that concludes our look at the third line of today's video. So in the fourth line today we're going to be looking at the Milner Berry Gambit. So this begins uh, with uh, same moves as we've had before, c5, c3, knight c6, knight f3, queen b6, and now instead of a3 and instead of bishop e2, we have bishop d3. Now this is a gambit because if black plays this properly, black tends to end up winning the pawn on d4. However, if white knows what they're doing, the position can be very double-edged. So here the correct move for black is to take in the center first and then to play bishop d7. Now bishop d7 prepares knight takes on d4 as, uh, as without playing bishop d7 white has queen a4 check after knight takes d4 and uh, this would simply win the knight on d4. So black must play bishop d7 to prevent this. And now we typically have white castling. Now black has the opportunity to take the pawn, and indeed black should take this pawn here with knight takes d4. 
Now white has two options. Here, the more popular of the two options actually results in a much better game for black. The popular option here is knight takes d4. However, he, uh, with this variation, black wins 44% and white wins only 23%. So we're going to look at the best variation for white here, which is knight bd2. Uh, knight bd2, black wins 31%, while white wins 37%. So we have knight bd2, and now uh, black can develop here with knight e7, for example, although other moves are also possible, such as moving the knight back to c6, or even taking on f3 with check. And now white's logical plan here is to begin chasing the black queen around, and gain some tempi, so white will take on d4. We have queen takes, and now knight f3 attacking the queen. The queen has a couple of options. Uh, the queen can go back to b6 or to a4. a4 might be slightly preferable offering a trade of queens, which of course would be favorable to black, as black is up a pawn here. Uh, white uh, would like to decline this trade with b3, and uh, black will now have to play queen a5, uh, moving the queen again. And white can just continue attacking the black queen, bishop d2, and now the queen basically has to go back to d8 here. And now we have an interesting position on the board. Uh, Stockfish evaluates this at minus 0.2, so white has plenty of compensation for the uh, pawn that was gambited. Black is underdeveloped compared to white, and white has quite a strong pawn on e5 that may be difficult for black to remove. Once again, we're going to see a battle for the c-file here, as is typical in many variations in the advanced variation. And black would like to castle here, and uh, when play f6 at a favorable point in time, to remove this strong pawn clamping down on the black position at e5. So that concludes our look at the milner berry Gambit. So in our final line of today's video, we're going to be looking at another Gambit by White, the Ruizdonk Gambit. So this occurs uh, if on the fourth move, instead of playing c3, White goes for knight f3. Now the best move for black is to capture in the center, and now if white has committed to playing the gambit, white will play bishop d3, aiming for fast development here and uh, not worrying about this pawn on d4. So black will typically play knight c6 here, and now white will continue with the plan of rapid development and castle. Now black would like to put some pressure on the pawn on e5, so black's next idea is to bring the knight from g8 to g6 via e7 to uh, place some pressure on that pawn, so black plays knight g7, and white defends the pawn now with bishop f4. Black continues with the plan, playing knight g6, and white now does not want to part with the strong bishop on d3, or, of course, with the bishop on f4, so white will play bishop g3.
Now, the logical move for black here is to continue developing bishop e7, and white will do so as well with knight bd2. And here, black's best move is to castle. Now, white will typically play knight b3, attacking this pawn on d4. And black has a few options to do, but the best option is actually to play queen b6. Queen b6 defends the pawn and tells white that if white is ever going to uh, take this pawn in the future um, with the knight on b3, for example, it will expose the pawn on b2 to the white queen's attack. Now, typically, we're going to see some uh, pawn pushes on the flanks here. Either a4 or h4 are both possible for white in this position, and uh, black might like to push some of those pawns themselves. Now, this could lead to quite an exciting game. Uh, on the other hand, white could also make their strategy uh, to simply pick up the pawn on d4, and if white can do this without losing any pawns, uh, for example, the pawn on e5 is quite vulnerable, and the pawn on b2 uh, is a potential target for the black queen, If white can pick up the pawn on d4 without losing any pawns, then white stands slightly better here as the black bishop on c8 is locked in and out of the game. However, if black is able to pick up the pawn on e5 in exchange uh, and remain a pawn up, then black has a solid position and um, will stand better if if they're able to reach an end game. So that concludes the fifth and final line of today's Five Lines video. Uh, this has been Dan with Five Lines to Know. Hope you enjoyed it, hope you learned something, and see you next time.